Well, I've got wedding on the brain, I have to say. As many of you know, my family and I are still basking in the afterglow of our eldest daughter, Haliana's wedding, which we held down in Ripley Chapel uh, last weekend, a week ago today. This has been a big year for our family. The last time I was up here preaching, it was in the aftermath of my 30-day retreat and my father's death, and now it's in the afterglow of a big family wedding. <clears throat> Funerals and weddings. They are some of the biggest moments in one's life and, and in a certain way have similar dynamics that go on, right? Last spring I was reflecting on my father's dying pro process and I preached on Lazarus' death and I spoke about the effect that dying and death has on the wider community, saying that the hole left by the death of a loved one creates something of this ingathering of presence and love to fill in that gap. Well, the same is true of, of weddings, I've realized, though it's not the absence and departure of someone that creates this ingathering, this centripetal pull of love and presence but rather it's the unifying of two people and an expression of love. Death and marriage, marriage and death, both generate this outburst of energy that then creates this inflow of love. I mean, don't get me wrong, both death and marriage can also bring out the crazy in people a bit and families, but usually that is far overshadowed by the love, the love that gathers and swells and lifts everyone up. Death and marriage. And these sit, interestingly enough, front and center in our understanding of God in relation to us according to our sacred scriptures. Of course, what would texts of wisdom and guidance be unless they spoke to our fear of death and our joy of relationship? And if there's an end, which of course they're linked because a big part of the fear of death is the severing of relationship. And if there's one promise, one point of hope that comes through the arcing narrative of the biblical story, it would be that death doesn't actually have the power to sever us from one another or from God, from the love of God. There may be weeping in the nighttime of our lives, but joy is promised for the morning whenever morning finally arrives. The biblical story begins with relationship and union all the way back in Genesis, at the very beginning when God created the human being to be in covenantal relationship with one another and with God's self. A marriage of sorts that involved mutual agreement, fidelity, trust, sacrifice of one to the other. And so it was a relationship of love that humanity was invited into. A relationship of love. It's there at the very beginning, and as we heard Maeve read from the last book of the Bible, Revelation, it's there at the very end, the image that John of Patmos uses for the fulfillment of all time is a great wedding feast. It begins in union in, in the Garden of Eden, and it ends in union in the Garden of the New Jerusalem. In between is the struggle of falling away from one another and coming back together and falling away and back together. But the point is, is that it's union. It's the, a union of love from which we came and a union of love to which we are going. That's why the marriage motif is so strong throughout the scriptures because our understanding is that God is love and relates to us not in power and control, not as a boss or a military commander or a king with his subjects or even a coach determining our lives, but rather God relates to us as a spouse. 
a mutual partnering of willing love, spousal love. Wow. It's a remarkable claim that this is what the sovereign of the universe does. God seeks us as God's beloved. Individually and as a people, God seeks us as God's beloved. Which also means, though, that we can reject God's advances. Otherwise, it wouldn't be love. And we humans tend to have a penchant for that. A lot of ways that we reject God's advances of love. So in the prophetic literature, the the literature of of the prophets in, in the Hebrew scriptures, marital imagery is what the prophets use to cry out to Israel. And it's often pretty harsh and unpleasant. And, and particularly for, for women, I hate to say. I mean, the woman gets the bad rap in prophetic literature because the image is set up so that Israel is the unfaithful wife to, to God the husband. Um, and, and the prophets speak of Israel as turning from God's love to become a harlot or a prostitute. And the ruin of Jerusalem and Israel's exile is the direct result of this spousal unfaithfulness against God. And then in the end, as Jeremiah describes it, the final restoration of Israel, of God and Israel, will involve the restoration of the marital bond between the people of Israel and God. When Jeremiah says, I will bring my people back, and you will be my people, and I will be your God, he's directly referencing wedding vows that were said, my people will be your people, and your people will be my people. I will be your God, your God will be my God. My God will be your God, your God will be my God. And then as we move, and and so that's kind of the the very quick account of, of how the marital motif runs through the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, and then as we move into the New Testament, we see the marriage motif as strong there as ever. Right? Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom in a rebuttal against the Pharisees who are crit- who's criticizing the disciples for eating on, on the Sabbath. And, and he says, Jesus um, says that you don't fast when you're at a wedding party, when the bridegroom has arrived. You're not fasting, you're, you're engaging and celebrating. And John the Baptist in John chapter 3 refers to himself as a groomsman preparing the bride, which is, was the Hebrew people, um, for Jesus as the bride's groom. And then the church begins to take on that bridal um, role in the metaphor. And then you'll remember what Jesus' first miracle was in, in the Gospel of John, right? The wedding feast and his turning of water into wine, which is a prolonging of the seven days wedding feast which would have collapsed under the weight of no wine. (laughs) And then still further, there's the parable of the bridesmaids running out of oil and another parable of the invitation to people on the streets to come to the wedding feast because the inner crowd's not being very responsive to the groom. And then in the gospel, there's that reference that you often hear read at funerals, John chapter 14, when Jesus says, In my Father's house, there are many rooms. I am going ahead of you and will prepare a place for you there. That is specifically referencing kind of the the conjoining of, of, of bride and groom. It's a reference to the practice of the groom building another room onto his father's home. A chuppah is what it's called. A chuppah is built onto the father's home and then he brings his bride in on the wedding night. In my father's house, there are many rooms. There are many chuppahs, it would be if it was translated into Hebrew. And then finally, the culmination of the whole salvation story in the Bible, the end of time is seen as a great wedding feast where the Lamb of God is seated on the throne and invited are all those whose wedding garment has been purified by his blood the blood of Christ, washed in the blood of Christ. The new Jerusalem and the church are in the role of the bride, and God in Christ is the groom, 
in the final celebration of the love feast. I saw the holy city Jerusalem coming down from the heavens adorned as a bride on her wedding day. And before that, in Revelation 19, John has this vision of a great multitude shouting, Alleluia, for God reigns, rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. So that's a pretty quick and inadequate survey of the wedding motif in Scripture. But as you see, the biblical writers understood that there was something about the marriage covenant made in love and the spousal relationship that spoke to the truth about God and our relationship with the sovereign of the universe. <clears throat> so I'd just like to, to lift up three, what I find is, is remarkable things that surface through this motif. Surely there are more than three, but, but let me lift up three here. So first of all, to frame our relationship with God in the context of marriage, a wedding, and the spousal relationship is to frame it centrally in terms of love, obviously, and one of the central attending elements of most every wedding that you've ever attended, joy. And the joy that derives from deep and committed love. Sometimes in our, in, in, in our church, and I, I know I, I lead the way in this, we get so serious about our faith and we get so morose about our sins and needing to do better, and we env can envision God at, or even Jesus with a furled, furled brow and a condemning finger when it's supposed to be about love and joy, the joy that love brings. Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine, so the party would continue. What a guy. God wants our love, God wants our joy. This reminds me of a Mary Oliver poem where she uses mar a marriage analogy in talking about death. She writes, when death comes like the hungry bear in autumn, when death comes and takes all the bright coins from his purse to buy me and snaps the purse shut, when it's over, I want to say all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. It's a fuller poem than that. I, I meant to say I abbreviated it. But when it's over, I want to say all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. What an expression of joy, of the joy that we are invited into. Secondly, as I mentioned at the outset, there's something about both death and marriage, unlike any other events in our lives, that draw unto us the presence of others. There is this like concussion of energy at death and marriage that brings people rushing into the space. One of the remarkable things we experienced last weekend at, at Haleana's wedding was this incredible coming together of different circles of people, different families and bloodlines, of course, into unity and togetherness, and, and these different people from different aspects of our lives coming together that was created by the love being shared and publicly professed by Haleana and, and Zoot. His, that's his nickname, Daniel, is his given name. To say there's something marital about our relationship with God is to say that in and through that relationship, others are brought inside and included. Others are caught up in the love and the joy that's being drawn together. That's the effect of the love force of, that God has, of, of God. The effect that the love force of God has. Others aren't excluded and pushed away, but gathered in and made part of the new family that is becoming. And that is the promise in the end. 
And third, and finally, the book of Revelation is an account of the vision that was given to John of Patmos about the culmination of all things, the end of time, the apocalypse, the unveiling of all truth at the end, and what he saw was a lot of really bizarre things, beasts with multiple heads and horns, angels with many faces and many wings, and the defeat of the devil, and choruses of people and angels, but front and center, in the midst of it all, was what? A wedding feast. The wedding of the Lamb of God to the people of God. And so we see through John of Patmos that at the end of all things, at the fulfillment of all time, there is actually a beginning. Not an ending at all. It begins. The wedding feast begins. The new life begins. When time comes to an end, when death has done its deed, when all is finished, there's a joyous wedding feast that marks a new beginning. Tracy and I, who had our 28th anniversary actually yesterday, watched throughout the weekend all watery-eyed as Haliana and Daniel walked out of the chapel and then feasted and danced at the reception. And then we walked them to their car the next day as they left for their honeymoon. And we turned back into a strangely quiet, empty, still house. All the wedding festivities concluded. And we watched through the window as they drove away to begin their new life together as husband and wife. Peter Gabriel, in one of his latest songs, sings, There goes the sun back from where it came, the young move to the center, the mom and dad, the frame. And life in all its abundance and love in all of its mystery continues world without end. Amen.